Tactical aviation, the use of aircraft to support an army locked in combat on the ground, dates back to the First World War. Through much of the fighting on the Western Front, aircraft supported the ground troops by providing much needed reconnaissance information. Later in the war, as the stalemate in the trenches continued, both sides started attacking each other's troops with machine gun wielding aircraft. Others carried light bombs to rain down on trench positions. Once the war ended, both the British and American air advocates quickly forgot about tactical aviation as they sought to find an independent role for their air services. As the B-17 became the primary Army Air Corps weapon, tactical aviation in the United States continued to languish. Light and medium bombers were built for the role, but the Air Corps decided they would be used not in frontline attacks, but rather to hit enemy airfields and lines of communication. Chief among these medium bombers was the B-26 Marauder. The B-26 was made according to specifications to fly at a relatively high speed, carry a heavy bomb load, and deliver the bombs. And uh, uh, safety was a added factor that came in as time permitted. But a great airplane, a great airplane. Once you got 100 hours in it, then you didn't want to get out of it. Along with the B-26, the North American B-25 would serve as a solid, steady stablemate. While not as fast as the Marauder, it was eminently adaptable. B-25 is a real nice airplane to fly. It's kind of, uh, it, you, you bounce around a lot because it was very rigid and it had big propellers. And the propeller uh, my, on both sides, they're only about that far from your window. So you had a, a lot of noise, it was a real noisy airplane. But we really enjoyed flying because it was very maneuverable and just a fun airplane. The medium bombers that the United States Army Air Force developed were really designed to placate the Army in its need for close support operations. And since the Air Force really had a thing against actual battlefield air support, what they designed the bombers to do was to attack immediately behind the lines and suppress enemy supply and communication lines and that was known as interdiction missions. The British also developed a line of aircraft to do the same thing, and in 1940 in France, this concept was put to the test for the first time. And the Allied doctrine was probably sound, but the British certainly couldn't execute it because they didn't have the, uh, the quality of aircraft needed to do the job or the numbers. They were overwhelmed by the Luftwaffe. But if British tactical aviation failed during the Battle of France, it would come into its own through hard-won lessons in the desert only months later. The Africa Corps under Erwin Rommel got deployed into Libya and immediately undertook an offensive against the British. And this offensive was wildly successful. And out of sheer desperation, the British fighter pilots in the area began supporting their army through strafing attacks. Using their fighter aircraft as, as strafing platforms, they went after vehicle convoys and troop concentrations. And this proved to be wildly successful. And it was the first time, really, in an allied air service or air force that close air support was actually undertaken on a large scale. For this to be actually integrated into doctrine, however, would require some major changes in RAF thought and the overcoming of many preconceptions. The major preconception that had to be overcome concerned the RAF's beloved hurricanes. The Hawker Hurricane had entered service in the mid-1930s as the most modern British fighter aircraft. Capable of speeds over 300 miles per hour, the Hurricane was a pilot's plane, fast for its day, incredibly nimble, rugged, and fairly easy to fly. According to RAF doctrine, fighters like the Hurricane were to be used as air-to-air -air weapons only. Fighters were supposed to shoot down other enemy planes, nothing more. But in the desert in 1940 and early 1941, Hurricane pilots began to strafe ground targets. 
armed with eight 30 caliber machine guns, these attacks turned out to be devastatingly successful against Axis troop and truck convoys. By the middle of 1941, the RAF in the desert had refined ground strafing to the point where whole fighter squadrons were dedicated to such operations. Equipped with Hurricanes or American-built Curtis P-40B Tomahawks, these units scoured the front lines and the immediate rear areas looking for anything to attack. Meanwhile, light bomber squadrons equipped with Lend-Lease Douglas A-20s and Martin Marylands pounded the Africa Corps supply centers, airfields, ports, and tank loggers with bombs. In 1942, the American Army Air Force entered the Desert War. Several fighter and bombardment groups reached Egypt, where they served in support of Montgomery's 8th Army. When the Anglo-American invasion of Morocco and Algeria took place on November 8, 1942, the Army Air Force went into widespread action against German forces for the first time. Far from a strategic air war, the service spent the interwar years preparing to fight, the Desert Air Campaign was almost entirely tactical in its nature. Without factories to bomb, the American air units were forced to learn the tough and dirty work of supporting an army in battle. American medium and light bombers went into action against Axis airfields around Tunis, hit troop concentrations and vital road junctions. Bridges were also hit as the Army Air Force embarked on its first widespread interdiction campaign in its short history. <laughs> Meanwhile, the fighter units were also getting into the act. Convoy strafing became a specialty for groups such as Colonel Reynard's 79th. And a straight out strafing, we were right down on the deck. Right, right on the deck, I mean on the deck. Um, they were, those were the most costly missions. We, we lost most of our people in uh, strafing. The Africa Corps was an extremely disciplined outfit. And any time we attacked them strafing, uh, they, didn't, they didn't just hide or run. They turned, turned around and <laughs> fought back. They were shooting at us all the time, throwing rocks, if, if nothing else. Uh, literally, it was uh, one of the more dangerous things we did. If the Americans and British learned the craft of tack air in the desert, they refined it to an art form during the 1943-44 Italian campaign. P-47s roamed across German lines of communication, blasting bridges to pieces with thousand-pound bombs or shooting up truck convoys, columns of troops, and trains. We strafed a lot of trains. And what we always did if we strafed a train, number one, hit the engine. The next people started hitting in different spots and shooting from a distance because if they're filled with ammunition or uh, any kind of explosive, you could get yourself. So you'd hit two or three cars before you'd start strafing car by car by car. But most of the time, if you found a train, it's full of something going someplace, so you need to knock everything out. One of the ways we used to do this was get down and, and just strafe right down the train. We could hit a half a dozen cars. And uh, of course, we carried tracers so that when they hit, you, you know where they're hitting. So you could see that your line was just traveling right down the top of the train beautifully. Further behind the lines, the B-25s of the 12th Air Force hammered away at major railroad installations in northern Italy. These were some of the toughest targets in the theater. While the interdiction campaign continued, the Army Air Force began to experiment in Italy with closer cooperation with the ground forces. We had communications with the GIs 
radio communications all the time. And we had, usually we had a man with the people we're supporting primarily, who was with the ground and where we get ready to go to a target, he can talk to us. We also had a small plane that usually worked around and something we found out there was that if you're colorblind, you can see through camouflage. And we'd get colorblind people to act as one of the observers in this light plane to help us pinpoint our target. Thunderbolt pilots became especially adept at helping out the GIs in the front lines. Veteran P-47 pilots learned to accurately hit targets less than 150 yards from American positions. I got into combat and uh, very quickly all of our missions are supporting that army. Well, I took a dim view of that until we started getting a lot of personal contact with these people on the ground. We were their lifesavers forever. And it wasn't long until I didn't care whether I ever saw a plane in the air to fight with. The mission that we did for all these people on the ground was so fantastic, that's all I need. And I loved it. By mid-1944, the lessons of the Italian campaign were adopted by the other Allied tactical air forces. During the invasion of France in the summer of 1944, those skills and methods soon created the most effective tactical air campaign in the history of warfare. Our first job was interdiction, you know, of the rail lines and the airfields and the, all, all that kind of stuff. And, canals and barges and anything that moved, you know, we clobbered, you know, and we'd go on lots of missions over in, next to Germany and into Germany even where we'd fly in high, escort the bombers in, the B-8 Air Force bombers, and then hit the deck and come home shooting things up, see, on the way home. The RAF's second tactical air force joined forces with the American 9th Air Force, commanded by the irrepressible Pete Casada, to execute the pre-invasion air plan. Using Hawker Typhoons, the RAF ravaged German radar sites along the coast. De Havilland mosquitoes flew low-altitude pinpoint raids on key installations. Spitfires and RAF Mustangs conducted on the treetops reconnaissance, photographing the invasion beaches from as little as 25 feet. Simultaneously, the 9th Air Force undertook Operation Chattanooga Choo Choo. Hundreds of American P-38s and P-47s prowled the skies over western France, searching for trains. When they found a train or locomotive, down they'd swoop to shoot them to pieces with cannon, machine guns, rockets, and bombs. It was very dangerous to be in any train because I think the Allied fighters must have had orders to shoot at any train that was on any track. And I think after the war was over, the assumption proved to be true because there were locomotives standing all over the place that were all shut to pieces. In one stretch of attacks in the last week before D-Day, over 800 locomotives were destroyed by the fighter bombers. As the fighter bombers demolished the Third Reich's rolling stock, the B-26 marauders of the 9th Air Force pounded away at rail yards and bridges. Being a tactical aircraft, our targets were essentially anything that would hold up the Nazi capacity to move divisions, to move artillery, to move anything. So our missions were essentially railroad bridges, railroads, ammunition, refineries, uh, bridges, uh, tactically anything that could keep them. And toward the end of the war where the Germans had been able to move a division uh, in a matter of a day or so, they couldn't move that division in two weeks. 
By June 1st, 1944, their efforts had reaped huge rewards. Of the 27 bridges over the Seine that had been targeted, 24 had been destroyed and the other three severely damaged. Rail traffic in western France had been reduced to a crawl. As Allied air power destroyed Germany's rail, sea, and river corridors, the Wehrmacht grew increasingly reliant on vehicle convoys to deliver supplies to the front. But as D-Day approached, even these would soon be ravaged by the men of attack air. On June 6, 1944, the Allies launched the greatest seaborne invasion in history. The D-Day landings were a marvel of planning and execution. And as the troops stormed the beaches, the tactical air forces were there to give them support. While the heavies and mediums pounded the coast, behind the beaches, roving groups of fighter bombers swept down on German reinforcements and artillery racing forward to stop the Allied invasion. Moving on roads became virtual suicide for German tankers and armored infantry. Rocket-launching typhoons, mustangs, and thunderbolts ravaged entire panzer formations in the days after the invasion. The experience of the Panzer Lair Division was typical. As the largest panzer division in France, the unit received orders to march for the beaches following the Allied landing. In two days of marching, the division lost 300 vehicles to fighter bomber attack. For the next two months, the fighter bombers whittled down the panzer divisions while the marauders and havocs choked off any hope of reinforcements by working over the French rail system again. At the end of July, the Americans finally pierced the German defenses at St. Lo. Rushing through the gap, columns of American tanks and armored vehicles spread out behind German lines. Casada assigned each American column a constant umbrella of four fighter bombers. These four planes would scout ahead of the American armor and clear the road of any German obstacle. At the same time, the GIs would use their new radios to talk to the pilots directly. They'd call out targets and then hunker down until the planes swooped in and took out the German positions. Often we'd go out and we'd, we'd, uh, we'd get all kinds of notes from the ground forces. What a fantastic job we'd done. And they would tell us, this is what we found you had done away with on that particular mission. And of course that was our, our way of life. We loved to hear from the ground people, and they knew it. Anti-tank guns, artillery pieces, and even tanks were wiped out by this close coordination system. As the GIs moved forward, the signs of the fighter bombers' grisly effectiveness could be seen in the long, snake-like columns of burned and charred wreckage that cluttered the roads. Never in history had such tremendous damage been done by air power. In the end, it broke the back of the German army in Normandy. Through the fall of 1944, the Allied armies pushed the Wehrmacht back to the very ramparts of Germany. As usual, the tactical air forces were there to assist the ground pounders. The well-trained, disciplined marauder crews were among the best in the world at such work. Flying in tight combat boxes, they could plant their bombs with incredible accuracy right in front of friendly troops. As the mediums became more involved in close support operations, the fighter bombers began sweeping into Germany, shooting up trains, trucks, tanks, vehicles, and airfields. Airfields tended to be the toughest targets. Loaded with flak, it took courage and disciplined teamwork to knock out a German airbase. We were strafing an air drum, and uh, I don't know what it was, went right 
through the back of my plane, right about a yard behind my head, left about a four inch hole, but they had to set those things for so certain distance. And this one didn't explode when it hit me, it went through and then exploded beyond me, left two, about two four inch holes in the plane, right behind, it had been a little yard forward to blow my head off. We were going across an aerodrome and you gotta be careful going across the aerodromes, you gotta be in formation, don't lag behind or you'll get shot down. With the onset of winter in late 1944, the fighter bombers were forced to stay on the ground. Low-lying fog, driving snowstorms and blizzards gave the Germans a respite from the incessant air attacks they had faced since the spring of 1944. And they took advantage of it. On December 16, 1944, the Germans launched their last major offensive against the Western Allies. Codenamed Autumn Wind, the attack struck in the Ardennes Forest, a weak point in the American lines. Initially, the offensive, which became known as the Battle of the Bulge, drove the Americans back. With bad weather protecting them from air attack, the Panzers drove on through Belgium, hoping to cross the Meuse River and capture Antwerp. During the Battle of the Bulge, we had a bunch of bad weather where we couldn't see anything on the ground and nobody got to do anything. We had one clear afternoon and the bulge was up in Belgium and we killed all the tank lines right in that spot with, I think, two flights. And they couldn't get through the tanks there and finally they split and went out in a Y. Well, this is wonderful because once they were split, they were only half forced. They were much easier to handle, and we got them turned down in a hurry. The results were, for the Germans, horrific. Carefully hoarded vehicles, supplies, infantry battalions, and artillery guns were caught in the open and smashed to ruin. Under constant assault from the air and from three sides on the ground, Germany utterly collapsed. By early April, few worthwhile targets remained, and the Allied air forces gradually stood down. No one has ever doubted the success of tactical air forces. Tactical aviation helped devastate the Wehrmacht, saving thousands of GIs with their effective support. Such close cooperation blasted open the door to the Third Reich in the West. No wonder that the GIs grew to love their aerial escorts. General Eisenhower in his autobiography stated that the Ninth Air Force activity and accuracy uh, shortened the war by months. We knew the job we were doing and we knew the Army loved us because we were taking care of them in such a fantastic manner. We were doing a job and we got it done. Yet after the war, the tactical aviators were all but lost to history. Whether historians take note or not, one thing is clear. The graying soldiers of Eisenhower's armies will never forget the support they received from the loyal and dedicated men of the tactical air forces. Thank you.